of brief lecture on utilitarianism, in which we're going to talk about problems for utilitarianism. Um, actually, we're just going to, there's, there's many problems that we can talk about, but I'm going to pick three kind of the most popular ones that I hear uh, on a kind of day-to-day -day basis. And what we're going to do is kind of, if you uh, saw my last lecture on Bentham and Mill and utilitarianism in general, um, we're going to take a look from the hedonistic utilitarian's perspective and the preference utilitarian's perspective on each one and see what they would say. Okay? One of the most famous uh, arguments, and many ethical books are going to put some version of this, is what we call the lonesome stranger problem. Okay? Let's set this problem up. Okay? Basically, let's say we're in some uh, town way out west, maybe out in Arizona somewhere back in the uh, 1800s. Okay? And there's a small town in which there's one sheriff. There's maybe 200 people at the most in this town. Now there's been a spring of murderers or murders going on in the town that no one can solve and no one really knows who it is. But basically what's happened is the town has gone into kind of a, a stage of panic. And basically if there's another murder and there isn't solved, the, uh, the townspeople are going to end up rioting. And there's a good chance that they're going to kill a lot of people, uh, maybe even 20 or so people. And half of these may even be children that get stuck, caught in a stampede. Um, it just happens. Okay? And the sheriff is really kind of stressed out. He doesn't know what to do and has no idea how to solve the murder. And one day he's upset. He's walking home from work one night and he hears some rustling going on in the house. He enters the house and there he finds the murderer who's been killing everyone over his next victim. The murderer sees him, runs out the back door with his knife in hand, evidence and everything. And let's say the sheriff chases him down. Okay? And let's say they're near the Grand Canyon or something like this and the... Uh, the killer ends up running to the edge of the Grand Canyon, jumping off all the way down the Colorado River with his evidence in hand, the end of the story. Now, the sheriff knows that the murderer is dead, okay? But the problem is, he has no evidence to prove that he's dead or to prove who did it, okay? His, it's his word against uh, no one's, all right? Uh, he really has no way of, uh, of showing to townspeople that this murderer is gone, that he solved the case. And so basically what's gonna happen the next day is they're gonna discover there's another murderer without a murderer to be found, and even if he tells them that he jumped off, they're not going to believe him without evidence. So what basically is going to happen, the town people are going to riot. So he goes back to his office instead of going home and sits there the rest of the night and contemplates and basically freaking out. Now luckily, before he gets ready to go and accept what's about to happen, that morning, a lonesome stranger comes in. And a lonesome stranger tells him, I'm from out of town. I've been traveling for months. Uh, I don't have any family or friends. I'm just trying to find a place to find settle down. And right there, the sheriff gets an idea. And he goes, well... This, this one lonesome stranger has no family, no friends, no ties to anywhere else. It's just him. I could frame him for the murder, and we could go ahead and kill him for it, okay? The townspeople wouldn't riot. It would save 20 people, and the only person that would have to go is the lonesome stranger. And luckily, since he's not connected to anybody, it's just affecting him and no one else. The greatest good for the greatest number, right? Okay? Lonesome stranger dies for the sake of the 20 people who would die in the riot, okay? Now... Right there, something should sound wrong. I mean, something in our gut's going, well, this guy's innocent, he didn't do anything. Why should he, you know, this have to happen? Well, let's take a look from what the hedonistic utilitarian would say, maybe Bentham's, okay? Now, we could run it through the calculus and maybe we don't come out with killing this guy, but for general, basically, is whatever leads to the greatest amount of pleasure for this group of people will lead to the best result, okay? And so, from a hedonistic utilitarian perspective, we would definitely get, well, should we kill the stranger, or should we frame the stranger and kill him, or not? The idea is to frame him and kill him, okay? That would be the best, because in the end, it would prevent the riot, frame, and kill him, okay? It would prevent the riot, it would save those poor little children, it would help out, okay? Uh, but at the same time, we killed an innocent person. Even though uh, that seems wrong, according to hedonistic utilitarianism, it's the best choice and the most moral choice, okay? Now, if we take a look from preference utilitarianism, okay, we look at this way, maybe at Mills, we would have to ask about the higher pleasure, or what is the society prefer? Now, if the society prefers that killing innocent people is wrong, which if you look at the society, they obviously do, okay, they're upset about this, these innocent people dying, then perhaps the, the uh, sheriff has to be honest, not, to, not, not kill the lonesome stranger, don't frame them, and just admit what happened and hope for the best. According to preference utilitarianism, if the society did not prefer the killing of innocents or framing of them, okay? Then we say we don't frame them, we just face, you know, face what's going to happen. We'll just put face what's going to happen. It's going to happen. Okay? Now, if this society doesn't care about innocent people, which it doesn't look like they, I mean, it looks like they do, but in case they did, then perhaps we do kill the innocent person. What we see is this is a little more, has a little bit of relativity in it, perhaps, okay? If we're talking about society. Now, for Mill, 
Whether he allowed that relativeness in it, I'm not, I don't think so. He's more of what we think is Western ideals. And of course, in Western ideals, we do not believe killing an innocent person is something that is just, all right? Um, but even though we now don't kill this lonesome stranger, well, of course, we still have to deal with the problems of the riot, and that's going to occur. And so does that help us anymore? We still have a pickle, OK? So still some problems here, all right? Um, but what we seem to get out of it, there does to seem to be something, at least in my gut, that seems wrong with killing a lonesome person, even if it's for the or, uh, innocent person, even if it's for the sake of many, um, at least 20 people in this case. We'll have to see what that gut feeling is in a bit. Okay, so there's one problem: the lonesome stranger. Okay, another big problem and a very famous uh, uh, counter argument to utilitarianism is the fanatical, fanatic, let's see, uh, fanatical. There we go. Majority. Okay, so for example, what happens if you have one society? Okay, and there's ethnicity X in the society, which has, let's say, 900 people. And let's say there's also ethnicity Y in that society, which has 100 people. So overall, there's 1,000. Now, what happens if 100 people here, okay, really truly believe that, or it's the 900 people here in uh, ethnicity X, really truly believe that ethnicity Y, the 100 people, are directly harming them in the sense of they're taking our jobs, they're commingling with our race, they are um, pushing us out. They're, they're being paid for less money, this type of thing. And the fanatical majority decides that killing, or at least uh, genociding all 100 of them, is the best answer. Because there's no way, perhaps, for them to get them out of their country. Maybe that's the only decision they decide. Okay? And the 900 believe that that is the best way. The only way to ever completely be free of the nuisance of the wise is to completely kill them. And this, if we think about it, okay, according, let's, let's just keep thinking for a second, um, what would hedonistic utilitarianism say about this? So we'll here. Now what hedonistic utilitarians would have to say is, well, if the 900 people that, um, that are here um, are getting more pleasure than the 100 people who are definitely getting displeasure by being genocided, if this is more than this, then this action is a justified action. And it is totally moral for this group of people to kill off this many people. Because yes, there's a lot of displeasure here, but 900 people are going to be really, let's say, these X, uh, group X really hates Y. And if we can destroy them, they would be so, so, so happy. Okay? Sounds horrible, but according to hedonism and utilitarianism, it's kill them all. Okay? In the name of Metallica here, their album, kill them all. Okay? Doesn't sound like a good, uh, something sounds wrong with that, right? Genociding of people always seems wrong. Something, in, you know, in my gut at least says that. But what would preference utilitarianism say? Well, there's a problem here. If, it's kind of a couple ways we can think about it. If we think about it from Mill's point that we should be using ideal Western standards, we could probably see how this would be wrong. Okay, most societies, uh, most Western societies would believe that genociding of people, even if we disagree with them, is not the solution. And so, in that case, in one sense, we'd say, um, no, they're not allowed. Okay, um, cannot kill. All right, cannot kill. But if we think in a more relativistic way, which Mill, I don't think, does, but other utilitarians do. Um, and say, well, in their society, this seems to be what they prefer to get rid of and kill them. And if that's the case, it does live up to, their, to, to this society's ideal. And in another case, it means kill them all. Okay? All right? So depending on how you look at it, I think Mill, we'll put Mill with this one, would have to say no on that. Okay? And then we have kill them all. All right, here. Now, there's one other possibility. We could bring in Mill's harm principle, too and say, well, these people were, would be directly harming the 100, okay? Therefore, they can't do it. Um, that's something that shouldn't be allowed. But one thing I have to point out, what's not so clear is, is this between, like I said before in my last lecture, is the harm principle something between individuals where this individual does something, as long as that harmony, he can do it? What happens when we get to a larger scale, like societal scale? Because in some senses, uh, Mill does believe in just war, that there may be cases where you're allowed to harm others for the sake of the greater good. And I could see perhaps from their perspective, X perspective here, they may think they're totally justified. Um, and if they're not justified, we may need something outside of utilitarianism to tell us that. And therefore, we kind of that would be another counter argument to this theory. All right. So there's another problem: fanatical majority. Once again, Mill I think does a little better here and here. Okay, or at least preference utilitarians does a little better. But there's still hanging problems. Okay. And then finally, let's talk about, and this is really my favorite, okay, um, the problem of, of personal loyalty, okay? So you have personal loyalty, okay? Now let's say um, I have a son, I have a son, nine, nine years old, and I go on a trip 
with um, a friend. And my friend brings his nine-year-old son and his eight-year-old daughter with him. And let's say we're going on a trip like um, we're taking a, a cruise ship. We're taking a cruise ship across the Atlantic Ocean from Europe to America, okay? And uh, so we're, we're going on a cruise ship. We're hanging out for a couple days. I know uh, for my friend, we've been talking. I find that we both have big families, both have wives, all these things, okay? And then one night, we all go to sleep. I wake up in the middle of the night to a crazy, just crazy noise, and I look, and there's water pouring into the bottom of my, my room. And what I end up finding out, and I look around, is my son is gone. So I frantically looking around, I'm looking, I look through the room, he's not there, he's left, okay? I'm walking, maybe he went to get a snack or something, he left the room though, and this tragedy is about to happen. When I get out, I realize everyone's in a panic, and the ship is sinking, okay? I cannot find my son, but I somehow make my way to a lifeboat. And I take the lifeboat down and make it in there. Now I'm looking in the ocean, frantically, because people have been jumping over the, over the sides. I'm looking around everywhere, and I don't see my son yet, okay? I keep searching, I keep searching, I keep searching, and finally, right then, I see my son 20 yards to the left of me, okay? So I look over 20 yards, there's my son frantically uh, kind of waving his arms. And if you know anything about people who are drowning around others, they don't really think about you, okay? They're, they'll drown you, even if you're an eight-year-old child, you have a full-grown adult who's drowning too, is trying to drown him. So basically, if I don't go and get my son now, he's gonna drown, okay? At the same time, I hear screaming, screaming over to my right. I look over there, and there's my friend's nine-year-old son and eight-year-old daughter in the same situation, 10 yards from me, okay, about to drown as well. Now, if I go and save my son, then I won't get back enough time to save my friend's two children. If I go and save my friend's two children, I won't make it across in enough time to save my son. What should I do, okay? Now, many of you probably know exactly what you do, or what I would do, I know, okay? But let's look at what you, hedonistic utilitarians would say. So we have to put here, you, okay? According to hedonistic utilitarianism, and as always, whatever creates the greatest amount of pleasure for the greatest amount of good is what you should do. What should we do? And of course, according to this, we would have to save our friend's two children. Save our friend's children, okay? Because remember, from the example as we used, okay, um, my friends had, had a wife, had the same uh, big family just like me. It basically, if or if we both had one child, it would basically be the same amount of displeasure for both of us. But he has two. And so that displeasure would be far greater than the one child we would be losing, even though both of us would be in great displeasure. Now, that sounds horrible. How could you not save your own child? It sounds just, just terrible if you didn't do it. But according to hedonist utilitarianism, this is what we must do. Okay? But now let's look at what maybe preference utilitarianism, or what Mill might say. Now we have to say, what is the general idea that brings about the greatest amount of pleasure. And I think in this case, we might have a safe, okay? Uh, as society, we may all understand that it's your own son and that any of us in that same situation would save your own son. They definitely would. And so it's as a overall, we understand that that's what we should do. And maybe we save them here. So maybe according to preference, maybe we do save our own child, okay? Our own child, right? And that's how most agree. But remember, it's still, just like here, the lonesome stranger, there's still consequences for that. Those other two children are going to drown, and think of the, there we are, it seems to be now, going against the main motto of utilitarianism of the greatest amount of pleasure for the greatest amount of good. We are now causing a greater amount of displeasure than we could have. But in this one case, if preferences are what we're going, going for, maybe it helps out. But my question, I really think it's a good one, is this. How many children would it take before we would give up our own child? Because that's the, the obvious question that's coming. It's theoretical. But really, because even Mill, would, have, I, I know in many cases, would say, you know, if it's one innocent life versus an entire country, you know, um, he may say it's OK, such as we may have to go in and fight a war somewhere. And those are some innocent people who will die. It's much better fighting this war there than having it maybe happen here or getting even farther worse and escalating to a much greater scale of catastrophe. So it's worth killing a few innocents if we're saving hundreds of thousands. I get that. So in this case, how many children would it take before you would give up your own? Okay, sounds horrible, but really, would it take, what if it was 10 children on the line? Would you give up? Most people say no. What about 100? What about 500? Okay, what if there was a school of 500 people and a crazy killer was saying, you either give up your one child or I'm going to blow up the school of 500 children at the same age? Okay, what would you do? Well, most still say, I'm sorry, I'm keeping my child. Sorry for those 500. But at the same time, what if your child was one of those 500? Okay, it seems a little, you know, off. How many, how many, uh, you know, people would it take before it's okay? All right, and maybe never. Okay, and I'm not trying to say this as a sick person, 
But I'm trying to think this is an idea that is inherent in utilitarianism. We'd have to figure out. I'm sure no one would ever want to give up their child, but is there ever a situation where it would be required according to both not only the victim's version, but also Mills? Maybe, okay? Now, here at the end we see that uh, utilitarianism, when it gets to the edges of it as a moral theory, uh, it begins to break down. It begins to have problems here with these kind of ethics of emergencies, we may call them. Um, but most theories break down at those corners. So maybe if we just take utilitarianism as a general theory overall, just to help us get through our normal day life, maybe it's a good one. But when we push comes to shove on those major issues, it maybe doesn't work as well. Mill seems to work a little better, but it's not perfect. Um, now, this could be with a lot of theories are like that. Or maybe there is a, this shows that it is a problem, a problem for it, and we, there is a better theory out there that could handle all these, as well as be a general theory of living. Um, who knows, okay? Um, but utilitarianism is a very popular theory here in America, and actually in the West in general. Um, are there other possibilities, maybe better theories? Perhaps one thing we may want to look at, and we will look at in upcoming lectures, is what I talked about in the last one, um, that this is a consequentialist theory. What matters are the consequences of, of an action. And one thing I would ask you guys, are consequences really what means something when it comes to ethics? Is consequences all that matter? Um, and some philosophers and some people believe no. What about one's intentions? For example, um, you know, what if I do something that has, you know, maybe really horrible consequences and I didn't mean to? Okay, like I did. I was trying to do my best, and something just bad happened. Like I'm trying to help a friend out, but I accidentally, um, you know, messed something up by doing it. Okay, um, we would say, well, it was an accident. Yes, the consequences happened and they were bad, but you didn't intend to do it. What about that? Or in some cases. Um, you know, yes, the consequences of an action may be good by killing this one innocent person, and we save hundreds, but, you know, what really matters is your intention or duty to innocent people. You know, you should never, your intention should never be to harm someone innocent, and therefore you shouldn't. So, do consequences matter, or is there something else that matters, such as intention? And when we look further at someone like Immanuel Kant and the category imperative, they may be something we could contrast with utilitarianism. But for that now, that is the end of our lecture of uh, the problems of utilitarianism. And if you have any questions, please email me. Um, but I'll see you next time. Thank you very much.